Atheists and agnostics have always attacked God and the Bible. But in the past few years, they have increased in their numbers and in their intensity of criticism. Their foundational philosophy is based on evolution. Does the theory of evolution explain the complexity of the vast creation on Earth and in the universe? Does evolution explain the origin of life? Does evolution explain the intricate processes in the molecular realm of DNA and RNA? My friends, there are dozens and even hundreds of questions evolution cannot answer. But you can answer these questions if you have proven God exists. Do you know how? Stay tuned. Greetings to all our friends around the world. According to the CIA World Factbook 2007, it is estimated that one-third of the world's population professes Christianity. 11.77% call themselves non-religious, and just 2.32% call themselves atheists. The CIA World Factbook also estimates that 3 to 4% of those in China profess Christianity, while in Hong Kong, 10% call themselves Christian. While atheists have always been around, they have become more active and vocal in recent years. They have increased their attack on God, religion, and the Bible. In the past several years, atheists and philosophers have emphasized a theme. Belief in God is irrational. One atheist went so far as to allege that such a belief is, quote, intellectual high treason, end of quote. The Apostle Paul gives a warning to such teachers in Romans 2, verse 21. You, therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? Further, the God who gave humans the gift of intellect gives another warning in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 18. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool, that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. Modern theories of evolution are one major example of those vain thoughts. Theistic evolutionists deny the biblical account. They say God started a process of evolution that we are only now beginning to understand through science. Materialist evolutionists go even further. They attempt to explain a creation without any creator at all. Let's understand. True science differentiates between macroevolution and microevolution. What is called microevolution can be demonstrated in mutations and variations in species. But macroevolution, the transformation over time of one kind into another kind, has never been proved, only theorized. Two major arguments against the theory of evolution are, one, even if macroevolution were true, which it is not, there is not enough time in the history of the universe for evolution to take place from non-life to human intelligence, and two, the evidence of complexity and intelligence in the creation argues against the probabilities of life form development from randomness and natural selection. Yes, true science can help us see the creator behind the creation. 
But science has its limitations. Sir John Eccles, Nobel Prize winner, was at the time perhaps the world's foremost authority on the mind and brain. He commented on the inability of science to answer the fundamental questions of life. Science also cannot explain the existence of each of us as a unique self, nor can it answer such fundamental questions as, who am I? Why am I here? How did I come to be at a certain place in time? What happens after death? These are all mysteries that are beyond science. Because it rejects divine revelation, evolutionary theory cannot answer these and other important questions. The reason evolutionists cannot answer major life-orienting questions is that they deny the reality of the spirit dimension. The Bible plainly states, God is spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. By rejecting God's word, they are limited to material knowledge, and they often err even in material knowledge. There are hundreds and thousands of questions that evolution cannot answer. Today we will look at five of the most important questions. Question number one, evolution cannot answer. What is the meaning of life? Oh yes, materialists can give you the standard answers such as self-preservation, self-propagation, and self-determination. But is survival the only meaning and purpose of life? Several human philosophies have attempted to answer that question. From the dawn of antiquity, thinkers have pondered the fundamental questions of why we're alive and how best to live life. The ancient Greeks came up with a wide range of answers. The fourth century BC saw the rise of three principal schools of thought in Greece, Epicureanism, Stoicism, and Skepticism. The Apostle Paul was quite familiar with these ancient schools of thought. Paul visited Athens about A.D. 50. Turn in your Bible to Acts 17, Acts 17 and verse 18. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, that is the Apostle Paul, and some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, or Mars Hill, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak. Paul then proclaimed to them the Creator God, who made the world and everything in it. And he made this fundamental yet astounding observation in verse 28. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. In him we live and move and have our being. Our entire existence, Paul was emphasizing, is intimately tied to the Creator God. Paul was saying that human life can have no real meaning or purpose apart from God. Yes, man was created to have a special relationship with his Creator. It's the very foundation of a meaningful life. The Messiah, Jesus Christ, also affirmed this highest purpose in life. He was asked by a lawyer, which is the great commandment in the law? Turn in your Bible to Matthew 22, verse 37. Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. That relationship leads to a change from selfish human nature to a loving spiritual nature. God wants us to be a part of His immortal family. We can be born into His kingdom, His family. The Bible reveals that this ultimate transformation takes place at the resurrection from the dead. The Messiah, Jesus Christ, is the firstborn from the dead. You read that in Revelation 1, verse 5. He is the firstborn of many brethren, as it tells us in Romans 8, verse 29. 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, gives an inspiring description of God's children being transformed at the resurrection. We shall not all sleep, 
but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Yes, you have an opportunity to belong to an immortal family, to be a part of God's kingdom and royal family. In his epistle to the Romans, Paul further explains one of the wonderful benefits of being born into this royal family. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. We saw that atheists are becoming more and more bold in promoting their anti-God evolution ideas. If you would like to discover more about how this topic impacts your life, visit us online at www.lcgcanada.org to read our featured literature free of charge. Evolution cannot answer one of the most basic questions that matters to every one of us. Question number one evolution cannot answer. What is the meaning of life? Question number two evolution cannot answer is, what is the purpose of the universe? Why does the universe exist? Is there a meaningful purpose for the universe? The universe continues to expand rapidly. Some galaxies are moving outward in space at the speed of 200 million miles per hour. Some galaxies are millions of light years in diameter. Why are we able to discover such awesome cosmic elements and movements and yet be unable to travel much beyond the moon? The space probe Voyager 1 photographed an image of planet Earth in our solar system. This 1990 image of our solar system was taken from a distance of around four billion miles. Planet Earth is barely visible and it certainly looks very insignificant. Carl Sagan, an American astronomer and cosmologist, considering this pale blue dot, as he called it, made this striking comment. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. Carl Sagan called planet Earth a lonely speck in the cosmic dark. Must we then conclude that we are so insignificant as to be meaningless? Should we conclude that the universe is meaningless? No. The universe is a powerful evidence of a creator. The earth and the universe were created for mankind. The creator of the universe has an awesome purpose for the universe. God has purposed that his children not only inherit the earth, as it tells us in Matthew 5 verse 8, but that we will inherit the universe. But we are in no condition for that now. That inheritance is yet future. Notice the concluding comment in Hebrews 2 verse 8. But now we do not yet see all things, including the universe, put under Him. Human beings must be born into the kingdom of God as immortal, glorified children of God. That takes place at the resurrection described in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4. As we prepare for that future, the universe exists as the environment for humans to learn about the Creator of the universe and to prepare for their awesome destiny. We look forward to the time when we will live in a spiritual dimension, not limited by space and time. God reveals this promise in Revelation 21, verse 7. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. As astounding as it may sound, God created the universe as our future inheritance. Question number two evolution cannot answer is, what is the purpose of the universe? 
Question number three evolution cannot answer is, what is the source of natural law? Even the great physicist Albert Einstein recognized meaning in natural law. Einstein stated that the scientist, quote, religious feeling takes the form of a rapturous amazement at the harmony of natural law, which reveals an intelligence of such superiority that compared with it, all the systematic thinking and acting of human beings is an utterly insignificant reflection. Do great intellectuals disagree with the brilliant Einstein? Would they call him irrational for his observation? Let's understand, those natural laws that amazed Einstein existed from the very beginning of creation. Scientists admit that they had to be in effect. Theoretical physicists Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose wrote, the only way to have scientific theory is if the laws of physics hold everywhere, including at the beginning of the universe. In his book, The Real God, Proofs and Promises, Dr. Douglas Winnale describes the importance of law in the universe. Even evolutionists begin their speculations assuming that these rules or laws work the same in the beginning as they do today. If the universe did not operate on those rules or laws, it would cease to function and would come apart in chaos. The existence of natural law demands a lawgiver. If you have your Bible, turn to James 4 and verse 12. God reveals, there is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? What is the source of that natural law? Atheists cannot answer that question, so they proclaim the question is meaningless. The great creator and lawgiver established natural law at creation. That natural law guaranteed the universe that resulted. And there is an additional proof. Not only is there natural law, but there is spiritual law that affects every human being. The Apostle Paul stated in Romans 7, verse 12 and verse 14, Therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just and good. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. The God of your Bible is the creator of the universe, and He is the lawgiver of both natural law and spiritual law. Question number three evolution cannot answer is, what is the source of natural law? Question number four evolution cannot answer, what is the origin of life? Early scientists assumed that the living cell was very simple. However, scientists have now determined that even the simple cell is very complex. Cells contain thousands of proteins comprised of amino acids. Even common proteins may contain a string of 200 amino acids. As science writer Bill Bryson comments, the odds against all 200 coming up to a prescribed sequence are 1 in 10 to the 260th power. That in itself is a larger number than all the atoms in the universe. For random events to produce even a single protein would seem a stunning improbability, like a whirlwind spinning through a junkyard and leaving behind a fully assembled jumbo jet in the colorful simile of the astronomer Fred Hoyle. Is this the kind of intellect atheists embrace, religiously believing the scientifically impossible? Thankfully, some honest scientists can admit their mistakes. Dean Kenyon, co-author of the 1969 chemistry textbook, Biochemical Predestination, believed for years in purely chemical evolution. But later, when science revealed the intricate processes by which proteins are formed through DNA, Kenyon repudiated his evolutionary theory. Science determined that it takes DNA to organize the amino acids into proteins. Kenyon later said, We have not the slightest chance of a chemical evolutionary origin for even the simplest of cells. As author Bill Bryson stated, Proteins can't exist without DNA, and DNA has no purpose without proteins. Are we to assume then that they arose simultaneously with the purpose of supporting each other? If so, wow! 
My friends, one must have a blind faith to believe that all the complex processes develop simultaneously and independently of each other in order to support each other. Evolution cannot explain that. Evolution has never proved that life came from non-life. What is the origin of life? Genesis 1 in your Bible describes the creation of life forms. Some mainstream professing Christian denominations embrace theistic evolution and deny the biblical account. God is the life giver. He created the first humans, as it states in Genesis 2 and verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. God created human beings with physical life and with a spiritual component. God intends for each human being to live an abundant spiritual life as Jesus said in John 10, verse 10. And yes, there is life beyond death. The Messiah Jesus Christ stated in John 11, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Question number four evolution cannot answer is, what is the origin of life? In today's program, we briefly review the complex nature of even the simplest life forms which evolution cannot explain. And we have seen that as a philosophy, evolution falls short. It cannot answer for the facts, and it denies the revelation of the Creator God to human beings in His Word, the Bible. As Jesus made plain in John 17:17, 17, 17, your Word is truth. Question number five evolution cannot answer is, what will happen in the future? Evolution tries to answer this question of where we came from. But even evolutionists admit, if they are being honest, that evolution is only descriptive and not prescriptive. Evolution portrays a violent and cruel process of natural selection in which the strong dominate the weak and only the fittest survive. Is that our future? Instead of harmony, love, and eternal progress, are we doomed to pain, suffering, and destruction? The truth is, my friends, that if human beings are left to themselves, warlike human nature will lead nations to the ultimate conflict to cosmicide, the extinction of all life on Earth. Scientists, statesmen, and generals have concluded from their experience and their observation that unless there is a fundamental change in human nature, a World War III will end life on Earth. The nation of Japan surrendered unconditionally, ending World War II. In his victory broadcast from the USS Missouri, General Douglas MacArthur summarized the historic lesson of war. Military alliances, balances of power, leagues of nations, all in turn failed, leaving the only path to be the way of the crucible of war. The utter destructiveness of war now blocks out this alternative. We have had our last chance. If we will not devise some greater and more equitable system, our Armageddon will be at our door. We should understand the reality of General MacArthur's warning, which echoes biblical prophecy. Ancient prophets such as Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel have accurately predicted the rise and fall of empires. The great empires of Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome made their mark on history. All fell as the prophet Daniel predicted. My friends, God has revealed the future to His servants. I challenge every atheist, agnostic, and evolutionist to read the book of Revelation. The greatest prophet of all, Jesus Christ, predicted the coming Great Tribulation, followed by the establishment of the Kingdom of God on Earth. Beyond the Great Tribulation lies a thousand years of peace on Earth ruled by the King of Kings and those who have been immortalized at the return of Christ. Beyond the millennium lies a glorious future. The saints will inherit the earth, the universe, and all things, as it tells us in Revelation 21, verse 7. God will renew the heavens and the earth. The Apostle Peter states this good news in 2 Peter 3, verse 13. Nevertheless, 
we, according to His promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. On today's program, we've examined five of the questions evolution cannot answer. What is the meaning of life? What is the purpose of the universe? What is the source of natural law? What is the origin of life? And what will happen in the future? Consider that evolution is equally unable to answer questions such as, what is truth? What is the spirit dimension? What is the human mind? What is reality? And many more. What source can answer those questions? Only the writings inspired by the creator of the universe himself, the Bible. Be sure to visit us online at the web address, which will be shown momentarily, and read our inspiring booklet, The Real God, Proofs and Promises. It reveals weaknesses and fallacies in evolutionary theory and gives you seven solid proofs of God's existence. You need to read this vital, inspiring, and exciting booklet. Be sure to join us every week on Tomorrow's World. Gerald Weston and I will continue to share with you the teachings of Jesus Christ and the exciting end time prophecies and their meaning. So join us again next week right here at the same time. If you would like to discover more about how this topic impacts your life, visit us online at www.lcgcanada.org to read our featured literature free of charge. The preceding program has been produced by the Living Church of God.